What's crack? Big dogs. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDG. Big dogs gotta eat. And today we're talking trade targets. Five players ish. I don't know. A couple that you could trade for. A couple that you could trade away. Week eight fantasy football. Week seven in the books. Got a big dub in E-Town Get Down. Needed that bad for my mental health. My mental health was down fucking bad after last week. But we're bike up. And we're ready to make some trades. Ready to pull trig. Before we do so, y'all know the rules. Let's tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. Z. <laughs> All right, so quick recap of last week. We had three trade targets, just three players you should be trading for. Number one was Michael Pittman. Can't get him anymore. Number two was Chase Claypool. I still think he belongs on this list because they had to buy both Claypool and Trevor Lawrence, who were the two guys that I had on last week's list. I still think are buy targets. Not that anything would fucking change because they were on a buy week. Chase Claypool on pace for 134 targets, 70 catches, 1,216 total yards. Okay. And Juju's out for the year. He's only scored once. That's the problem, all right? He's dealt with the hamstring injury early in the last game he played. Came out, missed a few snaps early. But he did play his highest number of snaps in the slot with Juju out, which was 16. The big days are coming, for sure. He's had some big days this year. Last week, when everyone played him, since Juju was out, he had a shit game. So everyone's kind of like off of mind when it comes to Claypool. Weeks 13 through 17, the Steelers play. Baltimore. Minnesota, Tennessee, Kansas City, and Cleveland. Fifth most fantasy points allowed to the wide receiver position. Chase Claypool is probably my number one buy right now in fantasy. Trevor Lawrence, another fantastic buy right now. He's getting way more comfortable with the offense in super flex leagues. Go trade for Trevor Lawrence. Weeks 14 through 17, Tennessee, Houston, the New York Jets, and then the Patriots. Tough matchup, obviously, week 17, but he'll get it done in the other three weeks. He'll get you to the championship, all right? So we have those two recap from last week. Uh, along with another impressive sophomore wide receiver, we've got Chase Claypool. We have T. Higgins. T. Higgins is my top trade target for this week. He missed a game, but in 16-game pace, all right? We're still using 16-game pace. I know the schedule is 17 games, but it doesn't fucking make sense. It's hard to calculate that shit in your head when you're trying to equate it to other statistics from the previous years and shit. I don't think I'll ever switch over to 17-game pace, but T. Higgins right now, 16-game pace of 138 targets and 80 receptions. If you had told me before the season that T. Higgins was going to end up with 138 targets and 80 catches, I'd be drafting him early fifth round and a fourth round probably. Problem is, he's not making a ton of big plays. Those are all going to Jamar Chase. And they will continue to go to Jamar Chase, all right? And don't hit me with that regression bullshit. When you got chemistry like me and Zendaya have, like Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow have, regression ain't ain't doing shit to it, all right? So those aren't going anywhere, the big plays, because that's just the way that Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase have molded themselves into for the last few years now. The, the argument to be made for Higgins, one, he's coming off a 15-target game, all right? And he didn't turn that into production. Anytime you can get big volume without big production, that usually equates to a trade for target. T. Higgins, last year he scored six times, six touchdowns in 2020, his rookie year. All six of those came inside the red zone, all six of them, okay? From one yards out, four yards, 16, two, one, and 20. Those are the yardage markers for his touchdown scores last year. Every one of them came inside the red zone. This year, all the Bengals do is score from like 50 fucking yards out. It's not complimenting T. Higgins' scoring ability. He is their best red zone target. He is their best big man threat when they get into those tight situations, all right? Now, Burrow, I'm going to hit you with the big facts. Burrow's big facts. Burrow has 17 passing touchdowns this year. Just Five of them have come inside the 15-yard line. That is a crazy statistic for a quarterback. 17 passing touchdowns. Just five of them have come inside the 15-yard line. And guess what? 40% of those have gone to T. Higgins. All right? So when they get down by the end zone, when they get down by the paint, the paint box, Higgins is the go-to guy. They just haven't got there because they're making so many big-time explosive plays. Those will continue to happen. I don't expect all those to continue to go for touchdowns, though. That's the difference here. When they get stopped inside the 20, that's when Higgins becomes a much bigger target, all right? Because you look at Burrow's passing touchdowns this year. 65% of them have come from 22-plus yards out. 53% of them have come from 30-plus yards out. He's got scores of 40 yards, 42 yards, 50 yards, 
55 yards, 70 yards, and 82 yards. That's just fucking madness, all right? So when or if I couldn't just sound like an asshole and Jamar Chase continues to score from 75 yards out weekly, you know, when this offense hopefully normalizes and they're not scoring like Mahomes and, and Tyree Kill every play or Moss and Brady or whatever, Higgins is going to be a big time playmaker in this offense. I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever if we started to, if we ended up seeing a stretch down the stretch, second half of the year, where he scores like six times in eight games or something like that. He goes on like a four game touchdown streak, and everyone's like, oh, that's a T. Higgins we know. They're just simply not getting to the part of the field because they're too good from far out for their offense to supplement Higgins' game. But I think the big games are coming and the touchdown scores are coming for T. Higgins. He's simply too good. And then we have two running backs in which I'm trying to sell right now. And I talked about them yesterday in the recap, in the recap, uh, or two days ago, actually, in the recap live stream that I do every Monday morning. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel because we go over game by game breakdown, everything that happened in the previous week. And it's the two running backs that I own in E-Town get down outside of Dalvin Cook. I never traded his ass. First one is Antonio Gibson of Washington, man. This might seem really, really obvious right now because he's dealing with the shin fracture um, and all the nonsense uh, in his lower body. So you might not be able to move him right now. You might have to wait for a bigger game. But this is him and the next guy are guys that I've been talking about moving for for basically since like week two or three because I think we know exactly what they are in their offense right now. If you look at this tweet from Jared Smola, Antonio Gibson route rate by week. It's gone down basically every week, 50%, 44, 35, 43, 40, 30, 21. Season low in week seven, which is followed by a season low in week six. And it's just going down and down and down and down. And Antonio Gibson is just not running routes anymore, which is, which is ridiculous because of how good of a wide receiver he was when he played at Memphis. Taylor Heineke dropped back 48 times yesterday. Running back routes run. This was week seven's game. J.D. McKissick, 36. Antonio Gibson, 10. And the other interesting thing to actually note here that I never really would have thought uh, about was the whole thing with the Washington football team and uh, their training staff and what's going on behind the scenes. This video from Stefania Bell, another thing to think about. Uh, the Washington injury situation on your radar for a long time. What more can you tell us about that? Look, this is a tough situation, right? As Dan referenced, and the players are well aware, their head athletic trainer is on administrative leave, but also their number two athletic trainer is on administrative leave. So if you take half the staff and you remove them from the facility, the question becomes, how are you meeting the demand for the players who need that care? And this is a critical question. I spoke with a source at the NFLPA last night who said they are concerned. The, the welfare and the safety of the players is first and foremost for them. And they want to uh, monitor how the club is going to be handling the care of these players. So it's admirable the people who are trying to step up and fill in, but you know, you hear this reference to bringing in interns and everything they're doing is appreciated, but you can't substitute the judgment, the care, the experience of people who have decades of experience as the head and, and, and assistant athletic trainers, uh, them being gone. Even just knowing the players, knowing what they're dealing with, uh, knowing how to work with them, there's a vacancy there and that's a real thing. And so I think this topic is not going away anytime soon and you just hope that the players are getting managed uh, in the way that keeps them doing what's best for them so we have gibson not playing in the two-minute drill or usually ever the four-minute drill he's not playing on third down jd mckissick is running all the routes and he's trying to come back from this serious injury without like the guy that should be helping him come back from this serious injury we have a it's just so many red flags here okay the real the only upside for gibson right now is like Sure, he's getting 18 carries a game, but they're literally all just shoving him up the middle for three yards per carry. It's so frustrating to watch. It's never getting him out in space. It's never involving him in the pass catching work. It's getting all the goal line carries. That's about all we can say right now. And Taylor Heineke is a, rush, a, a rushing quarterback. That's another downside. That's like we we're talking about how Saquon's pass catching upside is not to Christian McCaffrey's level because Daniel Jones is an athlete. He runs the ball. Taylor Heineke ran the ball 10 times last week. So what if normally uh, a, a non-mobile quarterback would dump off like three or four of those to the running back? Taylor Heineke just dumps out and runs rather than dumping it off to the to the running back. So that's another problem I see with Antonio Gibson right now. Just this his involvement in this offense presents absolutely no fucking upside. Nothing. If you're not involved in the receiving game, you don't have upside, which is what brings me to the second bangle on this team and the second running back that barely has upside. And that is Joe Mixon of the Cincinnati Bengals. He will be much easier to sell because he's coming off 
a big game, then a touchdown game last week, and the New York Jets this upcoming week. So you'll be, and then a buy. You'll be able to sell them really, really easily after the New York Jets game, in my opinion. Basically, what it comes down to is he is simply splitting too much work with the scrubs known as Samaji P. Ryan and Chris Evans in important situations. Every time someone in the passing game makes a big play in Cincinnati, it's not Mixon, all right? He had the one big play, the screen, a few weeks ago, and that was like the only thing he's done in the passing game all year. He's not, just like Gibson, he's not playing on third downs at all. He's not playing in two-minute and four-minute drills. There's no, that that's such a crucial part of the game for a running back to have upside in the passing game. The two- and four-minute drills are when those dump-offs come heavy, heated, and hot. Joe Mixon is just not that. All right, not he, he he's fucking it's disgusting. It is frustrating just like Antonio Gibson and it's bad because like Joe Mixon's upside strictly stems from Samaji Piran being out, like literally hurt on the COVID list. That's the only time he's got upside, all right? And you might look at Joe Mixon and be like, "Oh, he's the RB10 in fantasy right now." It's like, "Yeah, overall he's the RB10 in fantasy, but points per game he's tied for RB17, like middling RB2 uh, point per game numbers that doesn't really do much for your fantasy team that doesn't move the needle whatsoever for a guy that you hoped had top five upside and I want to talk a little bit more about his receiving workload all right week one he had 23 receiving yards week six he had that big screen play for the touchdown so he had 59 receiving yards all right so he had week one 23 week six 59 the other five games I don't think people realize just how involved he isn't in the passing game the other five weeks outside of those two games his receiving yardage totals two Four, zero, two, and zero. He literally has a weekly receiving floor of zero. It's happened. Mo- he has as many zero yard receiving games this year as he as he does games with more than four receiving yards. Okay, listen to what I just said. He has as many zero receiving yard games this year as he does with more than four receiving yards. He's not terrible. He just simply doesn't have a ceiling unless absolutely fucking everything breaks perfectly right for him in the luck department and he's not like Derrick Henry or Nick Chubb where he's giving you 100 100 yard 120 yard rushing games right he had the 120 yard rushing game in week one when they gave him 30 carries since then he hasn't gone over 100 yards so you include that game and he's averaging like 70 75 rushing yards per game plus a zero receiving yard floor right five games of four receiving yards or fewer it just it doesn't add up so again he gets the Jets this upcoming week should have a huge workload, should put up a pretty good game, probably scores a touchdown, probably has zero fucking receiving yards again, but this is a good game to sell him afterwards, okay? So Mixon is a guy I would move, I would move him for maybe someone like, you know, if someone's going to move Stefan Diggs, who is not playing up to snub right now, you know, you're looking for someone in that range. You're looking, maybe you add somebody to Joe Mixon and upgrade at the running back position. Like, I would easily easily take i mean this shouldn't be news to fucking anybody but i've heard this on legitimate podcasts that i listened to like last week someone was like i would take joe mixon over Najee harris rest of season i'm like yo how fucking bad at fantasy you got to be to say some shit like that live on air easily Najee harris over joe mixon you would take james robinson over joe mixon you take like anyone in the top 12 you're obviously taking over joe mixon so if you could put someone on top of him and move him after this jets game you're going to be happy you did so because he's going to have a ton of games where he runs for 60 to 75 yards and if he doesn't score a touchdown, which, again, all those touchdowns are coming from fucking 85 yards out, uh, he just doesn't give you a weekly ceiling because of the receiving workload that he's not getting. So Joe Mixon, Gibson, get him the fuck out of here if you can. All right, that now is down the list. So we have Mixon, Gibson, T. Higgins, trade four. Uh, Lawrence and Chase Claypool remain on this list because they're coming off of buys. That is all I got for you all today. Make sure you hit the thumbs up if you enjoy the video. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. And I'll see you all tomorrow where we are setting my lineups and making my sit start decisions on a live stream. So make sure you got notifications on as well because it'll let you know when I go live. We haven't done that in a couple weeks, so you guys will get uh, a recap of how I'm doing in all of my personal leagues. All right. Love you all. I'm out.